The Monday American is proudly part of the Podcast Advocate Network. To learn more, you can visit the website at podcastadvocate.network where you'll find other great shows and hosts, or you can just click the link in the show notes and get right there. Thanks for listening. Okay, so for those of you who've been listening to the show for quite some time now, you'll know that I uh, rarely, if ever, will take advertisements or will um, will run an advertisement unless it's like another podcast or something. Uh, but that's because I want to make sure that I'm not just hawking Blue Apron at you guys like every other show on, on the internet out there. Um, I want to make sure if I'm going to run an ad that it's something that First of all, I have a interest in it's a quality product or service and will be interesting to you specifically for listening to the show. That said, <laughs> I have this pair of headphones on right now and they are quite uh quite amazing actually. So this is a company called Sudio, S U D I O. It's a Swedish a uh, company that is um, in the market for making premium headphones with studio quality sound and a classic because they're from Sweden, Scandinavian design. So they are trying to what they're trying to do. Basically, they reached out and wanted to advertise with the show, and they sent me a pair of headphones to try out. I'm using them right now, and uh, I've got to say, I'm I'm completely completely thrilled with them. They're really really great. Their entire goal is to revolutionize the way that people see headphones. They don't want them to be just a tech device, but they also want them to be an accessory. And kind of right now with the market of headphones, you're pretty much going to get one of two things. It's either style or tech with the, you know, the stuff in the headphones that make them sound better. Um, and everyone knows that fashionable headphones tend to lack proper sound quality to say the least and the high tech you know the ultra techie headphones are kind of bulky and just not really oriented towards looking fashionable or functional and this company studio is pretty much out there to bridge that gap they emphasize their modern scandinavian design and they provide a product that matches the quality of even the highest rated headphones on the market for a fraction of the cost and they do free worldwide shipping. These headphones, they are Bluetooth. They last 24 hours of active battery life with 20 days of standby life. And they actually look really, really good. And you know what? If you don't like them, they have interchangeable. Um, the ones I'm using are over ears. So they have interchangeable caps uh, if you want to change the design of them. For the listeners of this show, if you want to go get a pair of headphones that are Bluetooth quality and actually don't look terrible, they actually look really good, uh, you can get 15% off of any purchase. Use the promo code the Monday American, all caps, and it will give you 15% off any purchase. So once again, that's studio, S-U-D-I-O, like studio without the T, dot com. Go pick up your headphones, and they're going to be shipped to you for free, 15% off with the promo code the Monday American in all caps and go get yourself a cool pair of headphones that actually sound really good. And you can also access that discount by just clicking the link to the um, website that I put in the show notes that is for studio. Uh, this episode is also brought to you by the three brothers, which is a new history book written by Stephen Marantelli. So basically the three brothers is um, it's, it's a book about George Washington and Edmund Barton, who was the uh, the the premier of Australia um, at around this time frame when George Washington was as well. And the Three Brothers is the name of a restaurant in London where they sat down. And the best way to describe this book to you, I've been I've been reading over it. Um, Stephen sent me a copy. It's really good, guys. You you really should go get a copy. I'll put links to um, Amazon in the show notes for this book. But I mean, it's six ninety nine on Kindle, so you can't really beat that. Uh, it's the best way to sum this book up is history with a mystery. So I've never read a book before that was a history book, an American history book, but also had this kind of mystery feel. Um, it's an original kind of witty behind the scenes peek into the rough and tumble world of politics and nation building as told by uh, Washington and Barton sitting down to eat at this restaurant. And there's copious amounts of drinks that are had as well. Um, the premise is that the military alliance between the U.S. and Australia 
it, it's one of the strongest in the world still to this day. And it started, um, of all days, on the 4th of July of 1917 at the Battle of Le Mel in France, where the American National Guard and Australia Corps, they fought side by side against the German army, and they won. The battle lasted less than two hours, but nonetheless, the alliance was sealed. So these two quintessential founding fathers, they thrash out the origins of America's federal constitution and Australia's Commonwealth constitution in the triumphs and tribulations of the Republican Commonwealth that they were so, I mean, instrumental is not even enough of a word, informing. The Three Brothers, it's uh, it's a really unique book, and I think you guys will really enjoy it. If you like this show, you should go get that book because I think you would would really, really just kind of dive right through that book. It's it's good. Um, it weaves a meticulously researched history um, of the troubled and similar foundations of the two countries. And it puts it all into a pretty riveting narrative that reads like a gripping novel, really, filled with uh, fly-on-the-wall vignettes about both nations' scrappy, freedom-hungry founding fathers. Uh, Stephen Marantelli is a he is a resident of Melbourne, Australia, and he's always had a fascination with history, particularly American history. And by profession, he's a barrister. And Stephen has a passion for American history, uh, in particular the American history of the presidency. And he said, quote, about 15 years ago, I decided that the best way to gain a thorough grounding in American history was to read presidential biography from Washington onwards. Can't argue with that. And he continued in saying, having read more than 150 biographies and numerous books about many of the events that occurred during the various presidencies, I was struck by the amazing similarities in the historic uh, I'm sorry, in the histories of both nations, in spite of America's Revolutionary War and Australia remaining as part of the British Empire. What better way to tell the story of the parallels and contrasts in America and Australia's history than over a dinnertime conversation with both George Washington and Edmund Barton? So the Three Brothers, it's a must read for any serious political mind or any American history junkie, but it's also a fun read for anyone interested in either American or Australian history. It's received a lot of praise, and you can go get that book on Amazon, or you can Google The Three Brothers, written by Stephen E. Marantelli. Okay, we are done with sponsors for this episode. You see how through a curveball at you, I normally never sponsor a show, and I threw two ads at you out of nowhere. Okay, uh, this is part four of the Vietnam War. We left off with the North Vietnamese had proven time and time again that anything that the Americans thought they were going to do to solve this dilemma in Indochina by ramping up their involvement was only going to be met with more force. And that's where we pick up part four with the North Vietnamese deciding that this is all they have to fight for, and they have nothing to lose. And on the contrary, America has an astonishing amount to lose. I hope you enjoy. You're listening to The Monday American, the show that puts the story back into history. History is all about discovering the why. And I think that in that process, it's important to never take the story out of history making history come alive one episode at a time the show made for the people by the people dive into the monday america don't worry we'll be gentle it wasn't until the later part of the fall of 1965 that lbj learned the very hard way that all the calculations and all the computers they didn't work that the project the projections they were all wrong, and that Vietnam was in fact a quagmire, and that he was in for a very long haul. Secretary of Defense was projecting nearly 400,000 men to be needed by the end of 66, and 600,000 by the end of 67. Even so, as 1968 rolled around, no guarantees. At that time, Lyndon Johnson began to change. He began to sulk. He wasn't open. He wasn't accessible, and it was not so easy to talk with him about the problems and difficulties involved in Vietnam. He was a good enough politician to know what had gone wrong and what he was in for and what it meant to his dreams, but he could not turn back. 
He could not admit that he had made a mistake. He couldn't lose, and therefore, he just felt like he had to plunge forward. The more he realized this, the more he had to keep it in. He had to keep it hidden in knowing that if he ever showed any doubts about himself, if he admitted the truth to himself, it would somehow go from a false reality to actual reality, and that those around him would immediately also know. Then he would have to follow through on his convictions. So instead of leading, he was immobilized. He was surrounded. He saw critics at every passing. Critics turned into enemies, and enemies became traitors. The press, which had a year earlier been so friendly and warm in his eyes, was now filled with enemies just gnawing at his heels. The deeper we were in, the more outcry in the country. And the more that Johnson hunkered down and isolated himself from what was actual reality, the worse it got. So what had begun as a credibility gap became something far more dangerous. It was a gap of reality. And so this sense of darkness began to creep up around Johnson as he viewed the path ahead in this ground war. And he took a very negative view of negotiations. In his mind, negotiations meant defeat. He hadn't been particularly eager for the first bombing pause in late 65, and the results in his mind had justified his doubts. Nothing but a propaganda benefit for the other side. Nothing but more pressure against him, making it harder to renew the bombing. So in the future, when there was talk of other bombing halts, he would react with anger and irritation that became a trademark LBJ reaction, and he would say things like, quote, Oh yes, a bombing halt. I'll tell you what happens when there's a bombing halt. I halt, and then Ho Chi Minh shoves his trucks right up my ass. That's your bombing halt. And he knew he was entrapped. By early of 1966, he was so far into the war that even he knew it. And if there was anything particularly frustrating in his mind, it was the inequity of this entire situation. Ho Chi Minh didn't have quote-unquote enemies nipping at his heels the way that LBJ did. It wasn't a fair fight. Yet he was locked into it, and of course, it became his war. He personalized it. They were his boys flying his bombers, his boys getting killed in their sleep. His entire public career, which was more than 30 years of truly remarkable service, had all come down to this one single issue, a war of all things. This one roll of the dice, and everything was an extension of him. Dean Acheson had warned him early on in his career that the one thing a president should never do is let his ego get between him and his office. And by 1966, Lyndon Johnson had let that happen, and Vietnam was the issue which had made it happen. In January of 1966, there would be a pretty big controversy, I guess, or a debate, you could say, over the bombing of Hanoi and Haiphong's petroleum reserves and oil storage facilities. The chiefs of staff had grown increasingly frustrated with the limits placed on them by the civilian government and people. And that's the way it's always been. The military has always despised the civilian control that effectively set their rules of combat. And they did not like that they couldn't wage war or combat the way they saw fit. And in a way, they're not, they're not really wrong. The most effective way for a government and a military to work together is the government decides what needs to be done and the military decides how to do it. Vietnam is a absolutely glaring example of what happens when that doesn't work the way it's supposed to. So the chiefs of staff and the government were debating about bombing these petroleum and oil facilities. They had grown frustrated with the limits placed on them, like I said, and they'd been pushing for these targets for some time, and they wanted them included in the May bombing lists. Now they had a new and powerful advocate within the White House in Dean Rostow, who not only believed in bombing, but he had a particular affection for bombing of electric grids and petroleum resources. He argued that the bombing of petroleum storage had sharply affected the German war machine in World War II, uh, which was just not even remotely correct. But he said, quote, 
With an understanding that simple analogies are dangerous, I nevertheless feel it is quite possible the military effects of a system, a system, uh, blah, pardon me, systematic and sustained bombing of POL, which stood for Petroleum, Oil, and Lubricants, in North Vietnam may be more prompt and direct than conventional intelligence analysis would suggest. He was right that the intelligence community would not understand the real effectiveness and the significance of hitting those reserves. The CIA in early June, estimated that it would have minimal effect. Now, despite all this, despite the CIA, their estimation of effectiveness being pretty much nil, the president gave the okay, and on June 29th, the strikes were launched. At first, it appeared that the raids were extraordinarily successful, with all of the Hanoi storage and 80% of the Haiphong facility destroyed. Robert McNamara had gone along with the petroleum raids, These raids would be the last method of escalation that he would recommend. What became clear in the months that followed was that the air campaign against the oil fields, although seemingly successful, had, like all the other previous bombing campaigns, completely failed because they still did not understand the most basic concept of the nature of this war. And it was that the North Vietnamese had learned to adjust to American power and disperse their reserves to areas that were invulnerable to American air attack. So at an extremely high cost in American men and planes, we destroyed the surface storage while the North Vietnamese were able to just pressure the Soviets into larger and larger petroleum commitments. For Robert McNamara, it helped seal his doubts about the war. He later criticized the Air Force and the Navy for the gap between the optimistic estimates of what the raids could do and what the actual results were were, um, pardon me, uh, which is pretty rich for um, someone who was fudging the economic numbers and causing one of the worst recessions in American history, but, you know, to each his own. In October of 66, with the military asking for troop increases, which shouldn't be unexpected by this point, um, it would bring the American commitment of troops to a minimum of 570,000 men on the ground. McNamara went to Saigon again. This time, his sense of pessimism, it was very real. He was convinced that the other side was just going to match us. That in effect, Hanoi was now waging its own unique type of war of attrition. It was like a psychological attrition. And it was against us slowing down the pace of the war slightly. They believed that time was on their side. And in fact, time was on their side. In one of the most ironic and hindsight being 2020 quotes of maybe this entire story, McNamara rem- reminisces about the fighting power of the North Vietnamese. He says, quote, I never thought it would go on like this. I didn't think these people had the capacity to fight this way. If I had thought they could take this punishment and fight this well, could enjoy fighting like this, I would have thought differently at the start. And that highlights again the grievous error that all these men of this administration in this era had committed, which was assuming that they were correct from the get-go. When in fact they were, they were so far from correct, they wouldn't have even been able to find correct if it was lit up in neon lights. It was a tragedy. It was a great American tragedy. And although up until this point, Johnson had been able to evade the public's protest and angst, he would not be able to do that anymore. In fact, they turned uglier, the protests, and they turned more personal, neo-violent, and then they finally just turned violent. Attitudes and deep passions that had long been hidden by the two-party system were now unleashed. More and more trusted staffers left, including some of Johnson's own people. When Moyers left, he felt like he himself had been locked in by the growing inflexibility around him, James Reston wrote that he was a casualty of the war, that he had been wounded at credibility gap. Sarcastically. Johnson himself was absolutely furious when Moyers left. Remember, he hated it when anyone left him anyways, but Moyers was special to him. He was the proxy son. Johnson went into a all-out rage after Moyers left. He was heard yelling things like that boy had been using LBJ all this time. And he was out there having dinner with the Kennedys advancing his own career. Well, 
I'm not that stupid. He knew what Moyers had been doing, and I read the clips, and why wasn't it that his press secretary's image kept getting better and better, but Johnson's image kept getting worse and worse? As the temper in the country grew uglier, the White House became less of a symbol of leadership and iconic history of the nation and more of a fortress, and security arrangements became incredibly stringent. LBJ, aware of the mood and the criticism of himself, the highly personal nature of it, he told friends that, quote, the only difference between the Kennedy assassination and mine is that I'm alive and it has been more torturous. It's very rich words from that man. Inside the fortress, his aides pleaded with him to go out more, leave the office, get some fresh air. They wrote memos saying that even if the demonstrators attacked or humiliated him, it would rebound to his own credit and that it was extremely unwise for him to just stay locked up in the White House, which it was. But the Secret Service, they would have none of it. It was far too dangerous that they said they had never seen this type of anger and instability in the country focused solely as it was currently on the chief executive, and they just couldn't permit it. Johnson was not able to plead the public effectively for this war either. Wars are supposed to unite nations. They they rally a divided people, and Johnson had pretty much counted on this in his private political estimations, but this war was different. Rather than concealing or healing normal divisions in the society, it widened them, and the gaps became total chasms. His aides began digging through history to look for comforting precedents of the time, and they had gone back to the World War II speeches of Franklin Roosevelt and they were jarred by just how bloodthirsty it all seemed. The Jap was to be smashed like the animal he really was. And in contrast, Johnson had to be restrained. He couldn't let loose the dogs of war. He had trapped himself in this total limited war that completely left him ineffective. But again, that wasn't going to stop these men and LBJ from doing what they had set out to do. Doing the hard thing was often doing the right thing, as wars often go down. And as a way of dramatizing that, that last point that I just made, one of his senior officers brought along the projections for what the invasion of the Japanese mainland might have cost Americans in lives had we not used the atomic bomb. It's a fascinating debate still to this day. They put in front of LBJ the figure of 750,000 lives saved. And LBJ, instead of his normal sulking manner, he piqued his interest and he was fascinated. He asked the senior military officer how they had arrived at that figure specifically. This is a good example of LBJ's quick-witted nature. And the answer was pretty quite simple, they said. Pretty quite simple is not what they said because that's something I just made up. That's not even words. Either way, they said that some of their bright young men at the Pentagon had fed the information from previous landings and battles into a computer, and they came up with the figure. Uh, LBJ seemed pretty impressed, and he asked to meet the young men who had made the projection. And when they were eventually ushered into his office, the president feigned interest in their methodology for a while, and then he told them, quote, I have one more problem for your computer. Will you feed into it how long it will take 500,000 angry Americans to climb that White House wall out there and lynch their president if he does something like that? And that was the only thing that stalled for a time the plan to bomb Hanoi and Haiphong. It goes to show you the ability to realize the reality around him, respond, and truly what is just a hilarious response, but also at the same time, completely ignore reality because he ended up going with that bombing raid anyways. It's such a odd, odd way that we started, continued, and carried out this war. It was now April of 1967, and support for the war was dwindling, and it was dwindling fast. General Westmoreland had 470,000 Americans in Vietnam, and he was asking LBJ for an increase which would bring the total to 680,000 men by June of 68, or at the very least, a minimum increase of about 95,000, which would bring the total to 565,000. But even with this increase, he noted that the forecasts weren't optimistic. Without the top figure, he warned Johnson, 
the war wouldn't be lost, but progress would be slowed down. And he said it wasn't encouraging, but it was realistic. And then Westmoreland noted that every time we took an action, the other side didn't just receive that action, but they made a counter move every single time. And after Westmoreland told the president that they just kept counter moving every time the Americans made a move, the president asked him something. He said, quote, when we add divisions, can't the enemy add divisions? If so, where does it all end? And apparently missing the entire premise of the question and the deeper meaning of the question, Westmoreland answered that the NVA had eight divisions in the country and he had the capacity to go 12. But if they did, the problems of support would be considerable. And he noted that if we had more men, so would the enemy. But we had finally reached the crossover point. He insisted that they had reached the crucial point in his war of attrition, that we were killing men more quickly than they could add them. In all reality, this was not even close to the truth. But even so, LBJ wasn't entirely put at ease from that answer. And he asked him, quote, at what point does the enemy ask for Chinese volunteers? And Westmoreland answered, well, that's a good question. And it's apparently obvious that Westmoreland didn't take in the full weight of what LBJ was really asking. And it it's these kind of conversations that that really make you feel for the man that put himself in this own disaster. But at the same time, he wants so badly to get out of it. And instead of doing that, he takes each leap farther and farther in the wrong direction. It's such a interesting presidency in that regard. He asked his commander after that what would happen if we stayed at the already high figure of 470,000 men. It would be a meat grinder war in which we would kill a large number of the enemy, but in the end do little better than holding our own. The limitations of troops meant that he could only chase after enemy main force units in a in a battle against a large force type of style. He foresaw that the war that was going on in the current fashion for five years at that time, uh, if the American force was increased to 565,000, Westmoreland saw the war going on for three more years with the full increment of 210,000. It could go on for two years, which would take Johnson into 1970. And the president asked him what would happen if Westmoreland did not get the full 210,000. And that's when General Wheeler piped up and answered that the momentum that the Americans had at that moment would die. And in some areas, the enemy would even recapture the entire initiative. Didn't mean that we'd lose the war, but it would certainly be a longer one. And for LBJ, a year away from a new election, already besieged by his own camp, and already sensing the growing, growing restlessness in the country, hearing these dark predictions of his generals was anything but a happy occasion. And it would be at this time, which would be two years too late, that the civilians were finally learning how open-ended that they had made the war, and how little they had determined any strategy at all. In a memo, John McNaughton wrote to Henry, or I'm sorry, Robert McNamara, essentially about the troop increases and saying that since no pressure will be put on anyone, this is a quote, by the way, I'm sorry, the military war will have gone on as before and no diplomatic progress will have been made. It follows that the philosophy, his quotes, of the war should be fought out now so that everyone will not be proceeding on their own premises and getting us deeper and deeper. At the very least, the president should give General Westmoreland his limit. That is, if General Westmoreland is to get 550,000 men, he should be told, that will be all, and we mean it. The government was clearly divided, but McNaughton made a very good point. They should have done this from the get-go and said, if you can't win it without more troops, then you can't win it. But we all know that isn't the way that they did things. So there were two separate entities in this war. There was the home front and there was Saigon. And if Saigon was headed by men who had no doubts and exuded an abundance of com- uh, confidence, then Washington and the U.S. were filled with men who were beginning to turn on the war entirely. And there was only one thing to do in LBJ's mind, and that was to bring Saigon to Washington. And in 1967, as a means of generating new enthusiasm for his war policies, the president brought General Westmoreland and General Bunker back home to America to make major speeches designed to uh, 
I guess you could say, polish up the war's image and remove the doubts that were growing at a viral pace that the public had about the war. But of course, these speeches and visits had almost no effect. Westmoreland's appearances just inspired more protest and more charges that the president was manipulating the military for his own political gains. For Bunker and Westmoreland, it was probably the first glimpse of just how serious the domestic problems were for the president at home. The protests against the war were no longer voiced by just some small minority. There was a deep, embedded, and growing frustration within a vast segment of American society. But that society had little link to the special world of Saigon, where so many of the decisions which affected American life were now being made. Like I said, it was like two different worlds. American domestic problems simply didn't matter to the officials in Saigon. The idea that an American society might actually turn on the war was an alien idea entirely. So Saigon was a separate organism, upbeat, confident, and optimistic. If Lyndon Johnson knew increasingly in his gut that it had all gone wrong, that the other side had not folded, and he had one thing working for him, the other side's victories, this is the North, North Vietnamese, their victories were never clear or tangible. The NVA and the Viet Cong were incredibly resilient, but their success was never, it was never obvious. It was never visible. It never showed when they actually made battlefield success. They never held terrain and they just faded into the wilderness in the night. And their strength was that they were in fact never visible. Even the NBC and CBS camera teams were constantly frustrated by the fact that they usually arrived at the battle after the other side had gotten away. And they had a movie film title that they titled almost all their battle films. And they called it quote, the Wiley VC got away again. So if the enemy and his gains were pretty much invisible, it was hard for any domestic American critic to make the case against the war. You can't really make a case for the success of an enemy if you can't find their success. And instead it was the words of general Westmoreland against the words of a bunch of, as they called them, snot-nosed college kids. And so LBJ and the Saigon officials would assure the American nation and these snot-nosed kids that we were in fact making progress and that the enemy had just about lost his will. And that all changed when for the first time those invisible successes finally became visible with the Tet Offensive. It would be the first time that the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong would display for the world to see their patience, their durability, and their overall resilience. And it became clear to millions of Americans all at once. In the past and up until this point, they had always fought in a distant jungle or rice paddy areas, making a quick attack and slipping away. Their toughness was rarely brought home for the American people to see. In the Tet Offensive, the, v the North Vietnamese deliberately changed that. And for the first time in this war, they took the fight to the Americans and they brought it to the cities. And that meant that that was displayed across every TV back home in America for all the people to see, all the gruesome after effect, and for them to see that they had been duped and lied to and that the war was not, in fact, well within their hands of victory and that they didn't know what in the world was going on. The Tet Offensive, although it wasn't effective for the North Vietnamese as far as a tactical victory, it was actually a tactical, they were destroyed, but the credibility of the American strategy of attrition was something that the Tet Offensive killed. And it's been long debated and studied by military historians and professionals that can, that I don't even want to, uh, to throw my own words into their mix because it's just, it's been so talked about and debated that it's not even worth me trying because there's just a lot of smarter men who say a lot of smarter things about this than I do. But essentially it's one of the most famous tactical losses that turns into a, a victory of sorts. And like I said, it was, they killed the credibility of the American strategy to the public so far. And it killed the credibility of the man who was by now 
LBJ's most important political ally, General Westmoreland. And if his credibility was gone, and so too was Johnson's, what little he had left. The Tet Offensive had essentially stripped Johnson naked on the issue of the war. His credibility and that of his administration were entirely destroyed. The Tet Offensive began in earnest on January 31st, and it would be felt for weeks. But within two days of its beginning on February 2nd, Johnson held a press conference, and he said that the Tet Offensive was a failure, and that the administration had known all about it, and in fact, they had the full order of Hanoi's battle orders. This was demonstrably untrue, and the public, they knew it. Rostow had been warned before the president went on air, before this press conference, not to do that and not to commit the administration's credibility into one more battle, and it would backfire. But they didn't listen, and sure enough, it backfired. And the administration was finally humiliated pretty much as, as bad as it can get on February 6th when Art Bookwald wrote a column, and it was datelined for Little Bighorn, Dakota. And the column said, quote, General George Armstrong Custer said today in an exclusive interview with this correspondent that the Battle of Little Bighorn had just turned the corner, and he could now see the light at the end of the tunnel. He said, quote, We have the Sioux on the run, General Custer told me. Of course we will have some cleaning up to do, but the Redskins are hurting badly and it will only be a matter of time before they give in. And so, with Johnson's involuntary cooperation, Hanoi had managed to make the White House look incredibly foolish. And the president was facing an election year suddenly more vulnerable than he ever could have imagined he would be. And it all stemmed from the tactical victory he gained that turned into the worst loss of the entire war, really, for the Americans in the Tet Offensive, which started at 2.45 a.m. as a team of NLF sappers blasted a very large hole in the wall surrounding the United States Embassy in Saigon, and they dashed into the courtyard of the compound. And for the next six hours, the most important symbol of the American presence in Vietnam was the scene of one of the most dramatic episodes of the entire war. They were unable to get through the heavy door at the main entrance of the embassy, so the attackers retreated to the courtyard and took cover behind large concrete flower pots. You can see video, I think, of this online, um, or at least pictures. And they started pounding the building with rockets and exchanging gunfire with a small, and I mean small, unit of military police that were inside. They held their positions until 9.15 in the morning when they were finally overpowered. All 19 of them were killed or severely wounded. The attack of the embassy was a very small part of the Tet Offensive, which was overall a massive coordinated assault against the major urban areas of South Vietnam. In most of the other areas that they attacked, the result was pretty much the same. The attackers were repulsed and they suffered heavy losses. And later that morning, standing in the embassy courtyard amid the debris and fallen bodies in a scene one reporter described as the butcher shop in Eden, Westmoreland rendered his initial assessment of Tet. The well-laid plans of the North Vietnamese and NLF had failed, as he observed, and the enemy exposed himself by virtue of his strategy and he suffered heavy casualties. It was true, but what he didn't realize was he was looking like a total fool in front of the world. Because at that point, America looked like a fool in front of the world, as we had defended our own embassy with military police from a surprise attack from an enemy that the public had been told was at the point of annihilation entirely. It wasn't a good day for America. So just what was this Tet Offensive? I like to call it the most brilliant move of stupidity and luck that I maybe have ever read about in a war. And it's because the overall idea and the goal of the North Vietnamese and the NLF in this plan, it lacked a a view of reality as far as how the people and how geopolitics would play out and everyone would react to this attack. But I won't get there yet. So 
they started planning the Tet Offensive during the summer of 67. And they came up with a new change of strategy. This is the North Vietnamese and the NLF. And they called it a General Offensive General Uprising. That they decided would achieve a victory. And some Americans have since depicted the Tet Offensive as a last gasp uh, desperation move, kind of comparable to what Hitler did in World War II in his last charge in the Battle of the Bulge, which a you know nearly defeated enemy attempted to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. But that's not quite honest. This decision to take the offensive, it probably did reflect growing concern from the NLF and the North with heavy casualties, but the damage done by the U.S. bombing of Vietnam and the costs of a prolonged war of attrition with the U.S., it might have just been that they were excessively optimistic with a growing perception that the areas of the urban South Vietnam were ripe for revolution, as they thought, and that the U.S. was vulnerable. It came after weeks of soul-searching and agonizing on the part of the decision-makers in Hanoi and a heated debate between the North and the South on the aggressiveness with which to pursue the war in the South. So they came up with their strategy, which was to lure U.S. troops away from major population centers and to maintain heavy casualties. A number of large-scale diversionary attacks would be launched in remote areas, and these attacks would be followed by coordinated guerrilla assaults against major cities and towns of South Vietnam, which would be designed to rock the Saigon government to its foundations and ignite a as they called it, quote, general uprising among the population and shake the will of the United States. They sought after maximum shock effect, and they planned the attack on the U.S. Embassy to do that. And their words were, quote, let us say to the world that we can attack anywhere in a place the United States could never expect, one of the Southern leaders proclaimed. And simultaneously, they would make new efforts to open negotiations with the U.S., the Overall aim was probably to force the collapse of South Vietnam and the U.S. withdrawal, and at the very least, they hoped through these coordinated actions to initiate a new phase of what they called fighting while negotiating. And that would stop the bombing, bring about negotiations, weaken the Saigon regime, and highlight the differences between the U.S. and South Vietnam, which would give them their ultimate objective, a negotiated settlement providing for American withdrawal in a coalition government controlled by them. Now, that's all fine and good. I mean, it's not actually good, but you have to consider for a moment how involved that plan is. There's no chance for success on that. It's completely ignoring reality. But surely the U.S. had been ignoring their own reality for quite some time. I guess it was the North turn. But it's almost like in... In football, I remember learning about a a wishbone, I think it was, a wishbone offense that we were playing against, and they had all this misdirection and fake handoffs in the backfield, and it all had to work together perfectly just to gain a couple yards on a dive or something like that. And if one single defensive lineman broke through, because of the amount of time it took to develop that play, they could blow the whole thing up. And that's a I think, well, obviously I think because I used it, but a great metaphor for how involved and how time consuming and how much each step relied on the previous, not just in total, but it relied on its total success in order to itself then be launched. It's a very hard plan to pull off. And as we end up seeing, they didn't even come close to it, but they got lucky and scored one of the weirdest military accidental tactical victories in quite some time in the history of warfare. So they began executing their plan in late 1967. In October and November, the North Vietnamese Army regulars would attack the Marines based at Con Tien across the Laotian border and at the towns of Loc Ninh and Song Bay near Saigon and Dak To in the Central Highlands. Shortly after two North Vietnamese divisions would lay siege to the Marine garrison at Khe San near the Laotian border, which was the American version of what the French experienced in the debacle of the siege against Dien Bien Phu. Now, while all this was going on, 
the best NLF units were moving into the cities and the towns in South Vietnam. They were accumulating supplies and laying out their final plans. In order to undermine the Saigon government, the NLF insurgents encouraged the formation of a, as they called it, a popular front of neutralists, and they attempted to entice government officials and troops to defect to their side by offering generous pardons to come and positions in a coalition government. The first phase of the plan worked to perfection. General Westmoreland quickly sent his reinforcements to Kantian, Lok Ninh, Song Bay, and Dok To. In each case, they drove back the North Vietnamese and inflicted heavy losses, but they dispersed U.S. forces, leaving cities vulnerable. By the end of 67, the attention of Westmoreland and the president and really the nation was on Khe San, which, like I said, many Americans assumed was General Zop's play for a repetition of Dien Bien Phu and the defeat of the French there. The press and the TV, they had daily reports of the action and insisted that the fortress be held at all costs. LBJ was keeping close watch on the battle with the terrain map at the White House War Room. General Westmoreland sent 6,000 more soldiers to defend the garrison, and United States B-52s carried out the heaviest air raids in the history of warfare. They eventually dropped more than 100,000 tons of explosive on a five-square-mile battlefield. And if that's hard to wrap your head around, to give you an idea, the bombing of Dresden in World War II, which is largely considered one of the worst and most devastating bombings on a any location in history, it destroyed the entire city that was 3,900 tons of explosive. And that was over the span of an entire city. This was 100,000 tons on a five square mile battlefield. In Tokyo, the firebombing that the Americans had employed to break the will of the Japanese in World War II, it lasted from January of 1944 to August of 1945. That was a total of 157,000 tons of explosives over the course of a whole city, over the course of a year. And these were five miles with 100,000 tons of explosives almost all at once. And to lastly give you another example, the first atomic bomb that we dropped was equivalent to 12,500 tons of explosives. I just want to make sure you obviously want to make sure you really can wrap your mind around the, I mean, awesome is probably not the right word, but the awesome firepower that was being displayed there. It was exactly what the North Vietnamese were hoping for. While they were preoccupied with Khe San, they prepared for the second phase of the operation. It was the offensive against the cities. And they had timed this offensive perfectly to coincide with the beginning of Tet, which was the Lunar New Year and the most festive of all Vietnamese holidays. Traditionally at Tet, people returned to their villages and engaged in a week of celebrations, renewing ties with their family, honoring their ancestors, having big meals, and they would often shoot off fireworks. Throughout the war, both sides had observed a ceasefire during Tet in Hanoi, correctly assumed that South Vietnam would be relaxing and celebrating with soldiers visiting their families and government officials away on holiday, just like they did. And while the Americans and South Vietnamese prepared for this, the NLF units readied themselves for the bloodiest battles of the whole war. They mingled with heavy holiday traffic. Guerrillas were disguised as Arvin soldiers or civilians, and they moved into cities and towns, some audaciously hitching rides on American vehicles. And you can't fight a guerrilla war very easily because there's no real uniforms for you to know who's enemy and who's friend. And it leads to a situation that's tragically funny where North Vietnamese soldiers were getting rides into town from American jeeps. Weapons were smuggled in on vegetable carts and even mock funeral processions hiding them in coffin. Uh, I'm sorry, in coffins, plural, not just one single coffin. That'd be pretty wild to see. So although this was a very extravagant plan, they were committed to it. 
And within 24 hours after the beginning of Tet, which was on January 30th of 68, the NLF launched a series of attacks extending from the demilitarized zone to the Ka Mau Peninsula on the southern tip of Vietnam. All in total, they struck 36 of four district capitals and 50 hamlets. In addition to the daring raid of the embassy, NLF units assaulted Saigon's Tan Son Nut Airport, the presidential palace, and the headquarters of South Vietnam's general staff. In the city of Hue, 7,500 NLF soldiers and North Vietnamese troops stormed and eventually took control of the entire city, which was an ancient Vietnamese citadel. The interior town had been the seat of emperors in the kingdom of Annam, and it was now in the hands of the North Vietnamese. But the battle wasn't fought just in the cities or just in these large ambush areas. It was also fought in the hamlets, where the combined action platoons, like I mentioned in the last episode, were there with their PFs. And Corporal Goodson, who was in charge of one of these caps, for example, they knew from their many sources of local intel that the attack of Tet was coming. Before the fighting started, though, they had probably one of the most surreal experiences of absolute bizarre nature that you can possibly imagine in warfare at all. They participated in a eve of battle Tet holiday banquet with the VC and the NVA. Like I said, in a situation is probably one of the most unique situations in the entire history of the war or war for that matter in in general, Corporal Goodson and seven other Marines on his team and the PF leader, they visited the enemy's remote camp at their invitation for a feast. He recalled by saying, quote, Every man in black PJs and NVA uniforms nodded respectfully as we passed, giving us four smiles that made no attempt at camouflaging the content and hatred they held for us. Yet even past the hatred, you could sense a fear and reverence for our presence. Corporal Goodson was six foot three inches tall. He towered over them, and he made a point of stretching to his absolute fullest height. Each Marine struggled to conceal his own fear, and they wouldn't betray and give away a weakness in front of the enemy. As the meal ended, an NVA officer stood up and spoke in English, and he said, quote, Welcome, gentlemen. I hope you have enjoyed your meal. You honor us with your presence as warrior honors warrior. You will all die tonight. Tonight, Marines, some of our men will collect the bounty we have placed on your heads. Tomorrow, we will celebrate with the same meal over our victory. But today, enjoy yourselves. Eat as much as you like. Hope we see you tonight personally, Corporal Goodson thought, as the man was talking. And when the banquet ended, they left with very little fanfare. The situation was both nerve-wracking and strange in the absolute most extreme way. They knew full well that they would be soon fighting a battle to the death, and they had sat down for a pre-battle feast among enemies that they were invited to. It was odd to say the least, and they felt as if they were sitting down with a meal, as if they were about to engage in nothing more consequential than a game of checkers. But they realized that time was short, and they retrieved their weapons, they smeared themselves with buffalo dung to blend in with their surroundings, and they settled into a predetermined ambush spot to catch them on their way to the hamlet that they were surely going to attack. And sure enough, right on time, the assault came at about midnight. They were called about the attack, saying, quote, It seemed like every tree and bush was alive with NVA and VC. Brazenly, they stepped into the light and opened fire with their AKs and machine guns. Green tracers and their deadly partners sliced away at the trees around us. American fire would slice through them and provide a weird type of half-light as they could see them falling down from rounds that hit their target. The team began running low on ammo, though. The battle was going on, ebbs and flows of pushing back and moving forward for an indeterminate amount of time, and they were running low on ammo. Corporal Goodson called his company commander, who was several miles away in a fire base, for fire support, and the enemy fighters were within 50 meters of his team. He said, quote, They were coming from all directions like a pack of wolves moving in for the kill. And instead of arranging for artillery support or helicopter support, 
the company commander accused Goodson of staging a fake battle for glory and medals, and he refused to provide any help. Goodson said he was angry beyond description. I truly can't imagine what that would feel like. I don't understand how a company commander could have so little faith in his own men, but it highlights the officers and enlisted men, the difference between them in this war, and how this was just not a war like any other. Goodson said that the only reason he survived that battle was because he was angry. He was angry to a point that he wanted to survive just long enough to kill that company commander. When the team was nearly out of ammunition and just about to be overrun by the enemy, a colonel who had gotten word of the attack and had a sensible head on his shoulders got on the phone, overruled the company commander, and came to the rescue with Huey helicopters and helicopter gunships. And that intense fire kept them at bay, the NVA and the VC, while they landed and resupplied with ammo. And by dawn, the battle was over and the enemy was gone. All in all, those Marines had lost one man killed and another man wounded, which, all things considered, is pretty light and pretty lucky. And Goodson wrote of the account, quote, Everyone was physically and mentally drained. Battles such as this one simply do not end with the last bullet. They are lived time and again in your mind as your senses attempt to cope with the horrors in the highs. It's an experience that, although I've never been in battle myself, I know that only those who've been in battle truly know what it's like. And the Tet Offensive was absolutely no different. From the ground up, it had a massive, massive rippling effect. Now, like I said, Tet was a massive and crushing defeat of the North Vietnamese and the NLF. The only exception for that overall rule was the city of Hue, which I mentioned they took. The liberation of that city took nearly three weeks. It required heavy bombing and intense artillery fire, and it ranks among the bloodiest and most destructive battles of the entire war. The U.S. and South Vietnam lost an estimated 500 killed, while enemy killed in action reports have been estimated to be as high as 5,000. The savage fighting, because that's really what it was, it caused a humongous number of civilian casualties and created an estimated 100,000 refugees alone. The bodies of 2,800 South Vietnamese civilians were found in mass graves in and around Hue, which is the product of NLF and the North Vietnamese using the opportunity of the city being in their own hands to eliminate some of their civilian rivals or uh, enemies. And they executed all those people. In addition to that, another 2,000 citizens were unaccounted for and they were presumed to be murdered. Other than Hue, it remains difficult to assess the impact, if there really was any, of the battles of Tet, strictly in a military sense. They certainly did not force the collapse of the government and and spark an uprising of the people. The NLF and the North Vietnamese have battle deaths that have been estimated to be as high as 40,000 people. And although this figure could be inflated, their losses were humongous. Tet re- represented a defeat for the enemy, but it was a costly probably the most costly victory in the history of the United States. American and South Vietnamese losses did not approach those anywhere near the enemy, but they were still pretty high. In the first two weeks of the Tet campaign, the U.S. lost 1,100 men killed in action. South Vietnam lost 2,300. An estimated 12,500 civilians were killed, and Tet created on its own as many as 1 million new refugees. As with much of the war up to then, it was a great deal of destruction and suffering with no clear-cut winner or loser. And to make matters worse for the United States, back in Washington, the Department of Defense had been, during the past year, turning up increasing amounts of evidence that highlighted the futility of their commitment to the war. Studies that had been made by systems analysis showed that Bombing just didn't work, and that for much of the war, North Vietnam's gross national product had actually risen to the pre-war rate of 6%. If the bombing was failing, so too, claimed the civilians at the Department of Defense, was the strategy of attrition. 
Although we had been engaged in three years of ferocious fighting, we had barely touched their manpower. Defense estimates show that no more than 40% of the males between 17 and 35 had served in the Army, that more than 200,000 North Vietnamese became of draft age every year, and that only about 100,000 had been sent off to the war. That's it. And their main force army had been growing, for sure, from 250,000 to 475, but the war of attrition that we were barely even touching them with, we were learning it actually couldn't even keep up with their own birth rate. And that is a staggering realization. If that is the strategy you've been relying on for the past three years, it suddenly is shattered in the worst possible way. And it would be at this point that LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, the man who started and prolonged and worsened this war in so many ways, would realize what his advisors, and as they were called the wise men, had been telling him for a while now. That the polls and the newspapers were also telling him the country had turned on the war, and they were about to turn on him. And remember, he was about to be going through an election, so the incumbent president, who's only served one term elected, he took over for JFK in the last year of his presidency, remember that, he was on the primary trail, and the next primary was Wisconsin, and he had just barely managed to escape the New Hampshire primary unscathed, but he knew that that wouldn't be an isolated test. The early reports for him in Wisconsin were pretty bad. There were no workers, no volunteers, and even less enthusiasm. Cabinet members went to Wisconsin in the president's behalf, and they drew some small crowds, but the president couldn't even speak on his own behalf. It was too much of a security problem. When one of his pollsters told LBJ to not even expect more than 35% of the Wisconsin vote, and he said, quote, to be frank, it's pretty bad. It might even be below 30. It was the moment that LBJ knew that he was beaten. He knew he was locked in. He could not do what he wanted to do on Vietnam, and he couldn't do that while running for re-election. And rather than absorb one more defeat and further damage his hubris, he withdrew from the race on the eve of the Wisconsin primary, and he announced that he was pulling back on the bombing. The war was finally turning around, and it was time for de-escalation, he said. And for LBJ, it was finally all over. Lyndon Johnson had lost it all, and so had the rest of the men alongside him. Although they were brilliant, and they had a healthy sense of hubris and sense of themselves, they had been entirely unwilling to look and learn from the past that they had been swept forward by their belief in the importance of anti-communism, and by the sense of power and glory, this type of omnipotence and omniscience of America during this century. They were America in their eyes, and they had been ready for what the world offered, the challenges that it posed. And in a way, LBJ knew better. He had entertained no small amount of doubt about the course he was taking all along the whole time. But he saw, given his own instincts, his own reading of American politics, his own belief in how he had to look to others, he had no way of getting off. He and men around him wanted to be defined as being strong and tough, but strength and toughness and courage were exterior qualities which would be demonstrated by going to a clean and hopefully antiseptic war with a small nation, rather than the interior and more lonely kind of strength and courage of telling the truth to America and perhaps taking on a good deal of domestic political danger while doing so. But they owed that to the people. But instead, they didn't even bother to involve the people in the country that they represented in the course that they had chosen for the country. In their minds, they knew the right path and they knew exactly how much could be revealed step by step all along the way. They had manipulated the public, the Congress, and the press from the beginning and all the way almost to the end. They had been telling half-truth at best about why we were going in, how deeply we were going to go in, and how much we were spending, and how long we'd be there for. 
and when their predictions turned out to be hopelessly inaccurate, and when the public and the press, well, well, hell, for that matter, Congress too, had finally caught up and been annoyed at being manipulated and turned on the war, they turned on them. They had turned on those very symbols of the democratic society that they had once manipulated and criticized for their lack of fiber or stamina, lack of belief. The day after he withdrew from re-election in 1968, Lyndon Johnson flew to Chicago for a convention of broadcasters, and he had placed the blame for failure squarely on their shoulders. It was their fault being that the cameras had revealed just how empty it all was. A good war televises well, a bad war televises poorly. And on this issue of the failure of everything he had been touching lately, there was no sense of remorse. There wasn't any concern on why they had all failed to estimate correctly. Rather, even in his memoirs, which are worth a read, but take it with an obvious grain of salt, Even in his memoirs, the blame was placed on the elements of the society which had undermined support for the war. When his book was finished, friends looking at galleys cautioned him to tone down the criticism of the press. It was an iota of public admission that they had miscalculated. The faults, it seemed, weren't theirs. The fault was with the country which wasn't worthy of them. And for all of the mistakes that they had made, for this to be the attitude of LBJ and his administration, after seeing clearly the failures that they had created, they deserve no no sense of remorse. They deserve no sense of forgiveness. They deserve no pity. This is on them. If a human can't look back at what has happened and learn from it and fix your mistakes, well, at least attempt to fix your mistakes, or at least convey a genuine sense of remorse or regret... They're not worth the time you spend thinking about them. And to make matters worse, all the social, political, and societal changes that were going on back home, they were being highlighted and they were they had reached their boiling point. Campus unrest mounted significantly. There were some 200 or so demonstrations that erupted at more than 100 colleges during the spring semester of 68 alone. The most publicized of them, and obviously violent, demonstrations took place at Columbia University in New York City, where radicals took over several buildings and occupied the dean, the president's office. After eight days, 1,000 police-wielding nightsticks forcibly drove out the protesters. The assassination of civil rights leader and anti-war activist Martin Luther King Jr. in April brought a latent racial unrest to the surface, nearly boiling over, but it did provoke rioting, looting, and the burning of buildings in urban areas across the entire country. The most visible and destructive rioting was, of course, in Washington, D.C., where members of Congress could see the flames of burning neighborhoods from their office windows, and soldiers wielded guns on the steps of the Capitol building. And it was amid all this chaos, anguish, loss, in defeat that Lyndon Johnson addressed the nation to tell the people of America that he would not accept the designation of Democratic candidate for the Democratic Party of America for re-election. Effectively, he was resigning effective at the end of his current term. And for the first time in the nation's history, the people of the country watched a president give up on national television after failing to see that the reason of all his failure was on his own shoulders. In the halls of the Democratic Convention, they were hanging huge portraits of their heroes of the past in the main hall, photos of presidents and national candidates alike. But LBJ's photo was not among them. It couldn't even be found in that same room. It could be found in a smaller room where photos of past congressional leaders were hanging. It was somewhat ironic that LBJ had always dreamed of being the greatest domestic president in the century, and he had become, without being able to stop it at all, a war president. And not a good one at that. The Democratic Convention in Chicago in August of that year dramatized the reality of a nation that was divided against itself, itself 
The radicals were in the ascendancy, and the yippies circulated rumors that the Chicago water supply would be laced with drugs, and a thousand protesters would float nude in Lake Michigan. Chicago's hardcore mayor, William Daly, in turn, ended up mobilizing more than 25,000 police, National Guard, and Army troops just to maintain law and order, and they barely did it at that. Anti-war protesters engaged his police in bloody battles in the streets. The convention ended up nominating Johnson's preferred candidate, Vice President Hubert H. Humphrey, and in general endorsed the president's policies, proving to some critics that the war could not be ended by working within the system. More importantly, the bloodshed of the streets of Chicago, or as it was being called, Nightstick City, was brought into every home in America, right into their living rooms, because it was being streamed on television. Streamed. It was being streamed on television in 1968. It was being broadcasted on television in 1968 in every home in America. And the nation simply could no longer turn away from the fact that the war in Vietnam had somehow caused a civil war within the United States itself. And among all of this chaos and destruction, there was a small, small light in the distance. The North Vietnamese had indicated through several back channels that they were willing to discuss the issue of peace in Paris. In a move that was largely in response to domestic pressures and a effort to help his own party, who was lagging in the polls behind the Republican candidate of Richard Nixon, Johnson, in late 1968, made a last-ditch effort to get those peace talks off of dead center. It was in the spring, and there was somewhat of a military lull in South Vietnam, and Harriman was arguing that it was a clear sign of the North Vietnamese interest in substantive negotiations. Abrams assured Johnson that a bombing halt would not pose a military threat. The North Vietnamese had been badly hurt by their spring offensive campaigns. In any case, the approach of the monsoon season would pretty much severely limit the effectiveness of the bombing for several months anyways. To appease the military, he argued, and keep pressure on North Vietnam, Johnson agreed. In the event of a bombing halt, only to redeploy American air power against North Vietnamese supply lines in Laos. The president, with apparent reluctance, committed himself to stop the bombing altogether, if some concessions could be obtained from the North Vietnamese. And over the next few weeks, Harriman, who was in charge of the negotiations between the North, the U.S., and the South, which was really the North and the U.S., he diligently negotiated to an understanding, as he called it. And although petty and childish and downright embarrassing for the two parties that, well, for the North and South Vietnamese, it was nothing short of a miracle that he got the negotiations to this point. Just to give a brief background without going too far into it, these peace talks had been failed from the start And it started over simply the shape of the table as a disagreement between the North and the South. They refused to acknowledge the official existence of each other in the same room. They were being childish. And for a war that was anything but childish, the chance to bring that to peace, and this was the way they responded. The negotiations would be two-sided, but... Each side, this was the Harriman strategy that he devised, each side was free to work out its own composition and to interpret the makeup of the other as it chose. That was what he proposed. Therefore, the NLF and the Saigon government could participate without recognizing each other as an independent entity. The North Vietnamese refused to commit themselves formally to these, quote, understandings, but they gave private assurances that they would quote, know what to do once the bombing that Johnson promised would stop had indeed stopped. And hesitant to the end, because this was just a loose agreement with downright childish people at that time, Johnson finally agreed to, as he called it, quote, go the last mile for peace. Although administration officials agreed that if the North Vietnamese took advantage of the bombing halt or appeared not to be negotiating in sincerity, they would ramp up their air operations right up off the bat all over again. So there finally had been an agreement 
So it looked like LBJ was going to hand off the war to, at that time, former Vice President Richard Nixon and the candidate that seemed to be in the best chance to win the election. And it seemed like, possibly, because of the progress of the peace talks, that Nixon wouldn't have to worry about a war at all. And no sooner had these arrangements been completed than the South Vietnamese walked away from the negotiating table entirely. Now, there's several reasons why a leader of a nation would walk away from peace talks for a a slew of different reasons. And it's impossible to know entirely why one leader might have hesitations over the other or whatever could be happening. And that's normally the case. But in this case, it turns out to be one of the acts of one of the most despicable acts of American politics by one of the most despicable men to ever serve, if you can even call it that word, serve the people of the nation. The reason that Thieu, who was the leader of South Vietnam, abandoned the peace talks and prolonged the war for quite a many more years is because he was encouraged by the Republican Party More specifically, he was encouraged by Richard Nixon to walk away. He feared that the Democratic pre-election peace gimmick would undercut his candidacy. In one of the most sordid episodes in all political history, Harvard professor Henry A. Kissinger, eager for a top-level foreign policy position, whoever won and adept at playing several ends against the middle, he used his contacts in the LBJ administration to ingratiate himself with the Nixon camp by keeping it informed of what was going on in Washington and the Paris peace talks. While candidate Nixon was issuing public statements putting the war above politics, his advisors employed the use of Madame Anna Chanel, a widow of the legendary founder of China's World War II Flying Tigers and devotee of Taiwan and other right-wing causes as a go-between to urge the South Vietnamese leadership to sabotage the administration's diplomacy, making clear that South Vietnam might fare better with Nixon in January with the incumbent Democrat desperate for a peace settlement in his last days of office. Johnson found out about the conspiracy through, ironically, illegal wiretaps and surveillance of some of the major participants, but he refused to expose it. And he refused to expose it simply because to do so would require him to divulge how he came by that information in the first place and reveal some of his unsavory methods of obtaining intelligence. And if this couldn't be the saddest moment of American politics, hopefully ever, I can't imagine a worse image for our nation and for democracy in whole. Essentially, What Nixon had just done was undermine an entire war and an entire peace effort in deaths of thousands upon thousands of people so he could get power. And it's it's no surprise that the repeating human theme in all of human history is the insatiable craving for power. You see it all the time, but Nixon took it to a whole nother level, just as LBJ before him had taken it to a whole unique way on his own. Make no mistake about what I'm saying. Richard Nixon had no qualms about postponing peace talks for two weeks, as it turned out, in which time he won a very narrow margin of victory, which probably the halting of the peace talks was accountable for. He was entirely willing to sacrifice the lives of thousands of American men, as it turns out, not to mention the enemy or the South Vietnamese, in order to gain the office of president. And in my mind, there's no more evil transgression you can commit against the people of America with whom you pledge to serve, because that's the opposite of serving. It's self-serving. And in that two-week delay, he took the presidency. And he extended the war for several more years, which led to the death, and I do not say this lightly, of thousands and thousands of people who should still be alive. 
those deaths are on his hand. In my mind, he's a murderer. I might be extreme, but you decide for yourself. During that delay, they finally figured out how to get them all at the same table. And like I said, the table was now the issue. The United States had originally proposed that the delegations be seated at two long tables to emphasize the two-sided nature of the talks. But North Vietnam had demanded a square table with one delegate on each side, which would underscore its contention that the NLF was a separate ent- uh, a separate party to the talks. Pardon me. Now, to get around this childish impasse, Harriman again had to come up with a game-saving strategy. He proposed a round table, and the North Vietnamese had acquiesced. But Saigon, South Vietnam, refused to go along. Their leader, Thieu, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, it's T-H-I-E-U, but Vietnamese is a very funky pronunciation, so I apologize. He may have felt that the issue was of sufficient symbolic or even practical importance to merit resistance, or he may have simply seized on it to stall the talks until a presumably more sympathetic to the South Vietnamese Nixon took office. Either way, Americans had lost patience with the South Vietnamese and their childish behavior pretty much to this point entirely. On the part of the South Vietnamese, Harriman urged Johnson to just negotiate without them. The South Vietnamese has been, as he said, quote, coddled and cuddled beyond belief. They're making all the decisions, but we pay, we die, we fight. And he pressed Johnson to begin to withdraw U.S. troops, irrespective of what Saigon and Hanoi did. North Vietnamese negotiators who were looking on snidely observed that, quote, usually the man leads the horse. This time, the horse is leading the man. The so-called battle of the tables would rage on for weeks. The U.S. delegation sketched table designs rather than drawing up evacuation plans. The two sides, posing at various times such inventive geometric creations such as a broken parallelogram, four arcs of a circle, a flattened eclipse, and two semicircles that touched but did not form a circle, as a solution to the table debacle. And finally, under pressure from the Soviet Union, probably to grow up and grow a pair, Hanoi agreed to compromise, a round table placed between two rectangular tables. And by the time that the infamous table battle had been resolved, the LBJ administration was in its last days, and any chance of substantive negotiations were in the past. LBJ was officially a part of American history, and no longer at the forefront of the decision-making. In 1969, Henry A. Kissinger would proclaim of Vietnam, quote, We will not make the same old mistakes. We will make our own. But the prediction that he made turned out to be only partially correct. Kissinger and Nixon, they did try new approaches, some of them which time would produce their own mistakes. But their policy suffered from the same flaws of those of their predecessors, Maybe partly because they murdered to get there to make their own policy, but I'm obviously not inserting my own opinion there. Although disguising in the rhetoric of, quote, peace with honor, the Nixon administration would persist in this asinine search for an independent, non-communist Vietnam at all costs. And I don't mean that as an endorsement of communism, but after how many years already just watching that this was not a tangible all tangible endpoint or solution, they decided to go full bore for it anyways and continue lying to the people. But they got office by lying and murdering in the first place. They decided they would be able to achieve this goal primarily by massively building up the South Vietnamese military strength who were childish and inept already, I guess they didn't realize that, and by the application of military pressure against North Vietnam, methods that had been tried and exhausted before and never even scratched success. The result was four more years of bloody warfare in Indochina, a marked increase in domestic turmoil, and a peace settlement that permitted American extrication but was neither honorable nor lasting. Neither honorable nor 
nor lasting. The era of Nixon at the helm of the ship of the United States. I hope you enjoyed a rather long, but I hope worth it, uh, episode, part four of the Vietnam War. Um, again, I'd like to say thank you to the sponsors of this episode, which is Studio Headphones. That's S-U-D-I-O. Their goal is to bridge the gap between technology and functionality and fashion and get people studio quality headphones at an affordable price that actually look fashionable. You can get 15% off of any order at studio.com by entering the promo code in all caps, the Monday American. Get yourself some good headphones, go to studio.com, use the promo code, be happy, listen to awesome stuff. You can also click the link in the show notes to go there directly, and I believe it should have the promo code applied for you once you arrive at that website. Also, I would like to thank Stephen Marantelli for sponsoring this episode with his new book, The Three Brothers. It's the story of George Washington sitting down with Australia's uh, premiere, and it's it's truly a phenomenal read. I hope you guys do go pick it up on Amazon, uh, wherever you can find it. Um, just support a historian who is a Australian American historian, um, and it's really interesting to see the similarities of how the two nations are so different, but so similar, especially in their foundings. So again, thank you to the sponsors of this episode. I hope you enjoyed part four and part five will be on its way to you as soon as I can get it to you, which will still be late. I'm sure, but uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, send us an email at contact at the Monday American. um, And you can visit the website as well to find out everything else. Thank you again for listening, supporting, and spreading the word. Uh, Again, if you want any stickers, I do have some left. You can just send me an email, reach out to me, and let me know, and I'll send you some stickers for free, no charge. Uh, Thank you again, and I am looking forward to bringing you the epic conclusion of the Vietnam War series with Part 5 as soon as I can get it your way. So thank you again, and I will see you with Part 5 of the Vietnam War.